Luis, you suggested an interesting idea. Imagine if most papers had a backstory section, the same way that they have an abstract. So knowing more about how the authors ended up working on a paper can be extremely insightful. And then you went on to give a backstory for the Feynman QED paper. Mm -hmm. This is all in a tweet, by the way. We're doing tweet analysis today. <laughs> how much of the human backstory do you think is important in understanding the idea itself that's presented in the paper or in general? I think this gives way more context to the work of, of scientists. I think people, a lot of people have this almost kind of romantic misconception that uh, the way a lot of scientists work is almost as the sum of eureka moments where all of a sudden they sit down and start writing two papers in a row and the papers are usually isolated. And when you actually look at it, it's the papers are you know chapters of a way more complex uh, story. And uh, the, the Feynman QED paper is a good example. So Feynman was actually going through a pretty dark phase before writing that paper. He was, he lost enthusiasm with physics and doing physics problems. And there was one time when he was in the cafeteria of Cornell and he saw a guy that was throwing plates in the air and he noticed that there was, when the plate was in the air, there were two movements there. The, the plate was wob wobbling, but he also noticed that the, the Cornell symbol was rotating. And he was able to figure out the equations of motions, uh, the equations of motions of th those uh, plates, and that uh, led him to kind of think a little bit about uh, electron orbits in relativity, which led to the paper of um, about quantum electrodynamics. So that kind of reignited uh, his interest in physics. And, and and ended up publishing the paper that led to the his Nobel Prize, basically. And I think it's it's there are a lot of really interesting backstories about papers that readers never get to know. For instance, we did a couple of months ago um, an AMA around uh, a paper, a pretty famous paper, the Gans paper with Ian Goodfellow. And so we did an AMA where everyone was could ask questions about the paper, and Ian was uh, responding to those questions. And he also he was also uh, telling the story of how he got the idea for that paper in a bar. Mm -hmm. So there was also an interesting and uh, a backstory. Uh, I also read a, a book uh, by um, Cedric Villani. Uh, this uh, Cedric Villani is this mathematician, the Fields Medalist, and in his book he tries to explain how he got from like. Um, a PhD student to the Fields Medal, and he tries to be as descriptive as possible about every single step, how he got to the Fields Medal. And it's interesting also to see just the amount of random interactions and discussions with other researchers, sometimes over coffee, and how it led to like fundamental breakthroughs and some of his most important papers. So it, I think it's super interesting to have that context of, of the backstory. Well, the Ian Goodfellow story is kind of interesting, and perhaps that's true for Feynman as well. I don't know if it's romanticizing the thing, but it seems like just a few little insights and a little bit of work does most of the leap required. Do you have a sense that for a lot of the stuff you've looked at, just looking back through history, uh, it, it it wasn't necessarily the grind of like Andrew Wiles or the Fermat's Last Theorem, for example. Mm -hmm. It was more like a... a a brilliant moment of insight. In fact, Ian Goodfellow has a kind of sadness to him almost mm. in that at that time in machine learning, like at that time, especially in uh, for, for GANs, you could code something up really quickly on a single machine mm -hmm. and almost do the invention, go from idea to uh, experimental validation in like a single night, a single person could do it. And now there's kind of a sadness that a lot of the breakthroughs you might have in machine learning kind of require large scale experiments. So it was almost like the early days. Uh, uh, so I wonder how many low hanging fruit there are in science and mathematics and even engineering where it's like, you could do that little experiment quickly. Like you have an insight in a bar. Why is it always a bar? But you have an insight <laughs> at a bar and then just implement and the world changes. It's it's a good point. I think it also depends a lot on the maturity of the field. When you look at a, a field like mathematics, like it's a pretty mature field. Uh, a field like machine learning, um, it's it's growing pretty fast, and um, it's actually pretty pre pretty interesting. I, I I looked up like the number of new papers on archive with the keyword machine learning, and like fifty percent of those papers have been published on in the last twelve months. So. 
you can see just the sense five zero or? five zero fifty percent so you can see the the <laughs> the the magnitude of growth in that field and so i think like as fields mature like those types of of moments i think naturally uh are less frequent um it's just a consequence of, of that the other point that is interesting about the backstory is that, is that it can really make it more memorable in a way and and by making it more memorable it's it kind of sediments the knowledge more in your mind i, I remember also reading the sort of the backstory to to Dijkstra's shortest path mm -hmm. algorithm, right? Where where he, he came up with it uh, essentially while he was sitting down at a, at a at a coffee shop in Amsterdam, and he and he came up with that algorithm over 20 minutes. And one interesting aspect is that he didn't have any pen or paper at mm -hmm. the time, and so he had to do it all in his mind. And so th there's only so much complexity that he can handle if you're just thinking about it in your mind. And that, like, when you think about the simplicity of Dijkstra's shortest path finding algorithm, it, it's, you know, knowing that backstory helps sediment that algorithm in your mind so that you don't forget about it as easily. It might be from you that I saw a meme about Dijkstra. <laughs> it's like, he's trying to solve it and he comes up with some kind of random path. And then it's like, my parents aren't home. And then he does, uh, he figures out the algorithm for the shortest path. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I stride I, I, through words <laughs> to convey memes, but it's, it's hilarious. I don't know if it's in post that we construct stories that romanticize it. Apparently with Newton, there was no Apple. Especially when you're working on problems that have a physical manifestation mm -hmm. or a visual manifestation, it feels like the world could be an inspiration to you. So it doesn't have to be completely in um, on paper. Like you could be sitting at a bar and all of a sudden see something and a pattern will will spark another pattern and you can visualize it and rethink a problem in a particular way. Uh, of course, you can also load the math that you have on paper and always carry that with you. So when you show up to the bar, some little inspiration could be the thing that changes it. Is there any other people almost on the human side, whether it's physics with Feynman uh, Dirac, Einstein, or computer science, Turing, anybody else? Any backstories that you remember that jump out? Because I, I'm also referring to not necessarily these stories where something magical happens, but these are personalities. They have big egos. Some of them are super friendly. Some of them are like self-obsessed. Some of them have anger issues. Some of them, how do I describe Feynman? But he appears to uh, have a... Uh, appreciation of the beautiful in all its forms. It has a wit and a cleverness and a humor about him. So like, it, does that come into play in terms of the construction of the science? Well, I think you brought up Newton. Newton is a, it's a good example also to think about his backstory because you know there's a certain backstory of Newton that people always talk about, but then there's a whole another aspect of him that is also a big part of the person that he was, but he, you know he was really into alchemy. Right? Yeah. And that he spent a lot of time uh, thinking about that and writing about it. And he took it very seriously. He was really into Bible uh, interpretation, and trying to predict things based on the Bible. And so th there's also a whole backstory then. And you, of course, you need to look at it in the context that uh, and the time that we're, when Newton lived. Um, but, it, but it adds to his personality. And it's important to also understand those aspects that maybe you know, uh, I'm not, people, are, people are not as proud to teach to little kids, but it's important. It was part of who he was. And, and maybe without those, he, who knows what, what he would have done otherwise. So, Well, the, the cool thing about alchemy, I don't, I don't know how it was viewed at the time, but it almost like to me symbolizes dreaming of the impossible. Like most of the breakthrough ideas kind of seem impossible until they're actually done. It's like achieving human flight. Mm -hmm. It's not completely obvious to me that alchemy is impossible or like putting myself in the mindset of, of the time. Uh, and perhaps even still, like <laughs> every, everything that, uh, you know, some of the most incredible breakthroughs are, 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 would seem impossible. And I wonder the value of believing almost like focusing and dreaming of the impossible such that it is actually is possible in your mind and that in itself manifests whether the accomplishing that goal or making progress in some unexpected direction. So alchemy almost symbolizes that 
for, for me. I distinctly remember having the same thought of thinking, you know, when I learned about atoms and, and that they have protons and electrons, I was like, okay, to make gold, you just take whatever has an, <laughs> yeah. an atomic weight below it and then yeah. shove another proton in there and then you have a bunch of gold. <laughs> so like, why don't people do that? <laughs> it seemed like conceptually is like, you know, this sounds feasible. Uh, you might be able to do it. And you can actually, it's just very, very expensive. Yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So in a sense, we do have alchemy and, and, it, and it maybe even back then it wasn't as crazy that he was so into it, but, but people just don't like to talk about that as much. Yeah, but Newton in general was a very interesting fellow. Anybody else come to mind? In terms of people that inspire you, mm -hmm. in terms of people that you just uh, are happy that they have once or still exist on this earth, I think, I mean, Freeman Dyson for me. Yeah, Freeman Dyson was, was, I've had a chance to actually exchange a couple of emails with him. He was probably one of the most humble scientists that I've ever met. Yeah. And that had a, a big impact uh, on me. We were trying, we we're actually trying to convince him to annotate a paper on Fermat's library. And I sent him an email asking him um, if we could annotate a paper and his response was something like, I have very limited knowledge. I just know a couple of things about certain fields. I'm not sure if I'm qualified to do that. Yeah. That was his first response. And uh, and this was someone that should have won a Nobel Prize and worked on a bunch of different fields, um, did some really, really great work. And then just the interactions that I had with him, every time I asked him a couple of, of questions about his papers and uh, he always responded saying, I'm not here to answer your, your questions. I, I just want to open it more questions. Yeah. Um, and uh, so that had a big, big impact on me. It was like just uh, uh, an example of an extremely humble uh, yet accomplished uh, scientist. And Feynman was also a, a big, a big inspiration in the sense that he was able to be, um, you know, again, extremely talented and, and uh, scientist, but at the same time, socially, he was able to, to, he was also really smart from a social perspective uh, and he was able to interact with people. He was also a really good um, teacher and was also to, did a awesome work in terms of um, explaining physics to, to the masses and motivating and getting people interested in physics. And that for me was, was also a big inspiration. Yeah, I like the childlike curiosity of some of those folks, like you mentioned, Freeman. I've uh, Daniel Kahneman. I got a chance to meet and interact with some some of these truly special scientists. What makes them special is that even in uh, older age, there are still like there's still that fire of childlike curiosity that burns, yeah. and uh, some of that is like not taking yourself so seriously that you think you've figured it all out, but almost like thinking that you don't n know much of it. And that's like step one in having a great conversation or collaboration or exploring a scientific question. And it's cool how the very thing that probably earned people the Nobel Prize or, or work that's seminal in some way is the very thing that still burns even after uh, they've won the prize. It's cool to see. And they're rare humans, it seems.